Income tax 2023-2024 makers depreciation. Which property class applies under GDS? Get ready and some coffee because we need extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. It can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website irs.gov irs.gov remember in the first half of the income tax formula basically a funny income statement most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income sole proprietorship schedule c rolling into line one income of the formula noting the schedule c itself basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses giving us in essence net business income which rolls in from the schedule c to line one income of the formula the formula outlining the calculations on the form 1040 this being the first page of the form 1040 the schedule c ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income schedule c rolling into line three business income or loss this is the schedule c profit or loss from business having an income statement format income minus expenses we're on the expenses which have the most different kinds of categories some expenses mean more complex than others such as depreciation where even if we're on a cash-based system as we saw in prior presentations the irs makes us do an accrual thing by not expensing things when we buy them but rather putting the depreciate the, the depreciable property on the books as an asset noting that that would be a balance sheet account and this is a income statement or profit and loss type of form we don't have a balance sheet and therefore we're going to have to use depreciation schedules to track the balance sheet account of fixed assets and the related accumulated depreciation calculating the depreciation on a year-by-year -year basis noting that the tax code basically borrows depreciation concepts from generally accepted accounting principles basically accrual accounting but then varies them to some extent the biggest exaggerations and variations being the 179 deduction special depreciation which we talked about in prior presentations which can be so large that you you basically end up just expensing the thing that you first purchased in the first place instead of putting it on the books as an asset which kind of defeats the point of putting it on the books as an asset but that's kind of how the tax code works it's going to do a bunch of weird stuff because of different rationales and reasons but now we're on the maker's depreciation. 
So the part of the depreciable property that didn't get sucked up by the special or 179, the part that will typically change from year to year is the 179 or special. You would think the underlying depreciation concepts of makers will stay relatively steady and constant given that's the part that's more tied to generally accepted accounting principles. That's what we're looking at at this point. So which property applies under GDS? So we have the GDS and ADS. The GDS is the most common type of depreciable property. People, It's so common that we probably don't even think about it that much. We just basically say maker's depreciation, and that's usually kind of indicating GDS type of depreciation. So the following is a list of nine property classifications under GDS and examples of the types of property included in each class. These are going to be some of the more common classifications of property. Remembering that for the tax code, we have less leeway than you might have under generally accepted accounting principles to determine the class of the property, which will then tell us how long we're going to depreciate the property over and the methods that we can use to do the depreciation calculations, such as straight line or double declining balance with what kind of convention, like a half year, mid month or mid quarter convention. So these property classes are also listed under column A in section B of part three of form 4562. For detailed information on property classes, you can see appendix B, table of the class lives and recovery periods in this publication. All right, so the, we've got the three year property. This is a fairly common uh, type of, of property. It gives you in the class kind of what we would expect the, the recovery period to be, right? It's a three year property. So uh, tractor units for over the road use, uh, any racehorse over uh, two years old when placed in service. It's kind of, it seems kind of sad to me that we actually depreciate <laughs> the racehorse as though, as though it's a machine kind of thing. But you know, we got it, we got to calculate it somehow. <laughs> any other horse other than a racehorse over 12 years old uh, when placed in service and qualified rent to own property defined later. So then we have the five-year property, five-year property, automobiles, uh, taxis, buses, and trucks. Remembering, however, that with the automobiles and whatnot, we, we might end up with some restrictions due to that automobile restrictions, which we'll probably talk about in future presentations. So you got to be a bit careful there. We also have complications with regards to business versus personal use. So any qualified techno technological equipment, uh, office machinery such as typewriters, calculators, and copiers. So obviously the tax code is taking in some older stuff here because we probably don't have as many typewriters these days, but those are still the examples being uh, used. Then we have any property uh, used in research and experimentation, breeding cattle and dairy cattle. So once again, the farming and whatnot, is kind of a specialty area. It's not something that I'm specialized in, a lot of different kind of uh, rules to it. So if you are a specialist in that area, it could be a great specialty place uh, to be. If you're not, you're gonna need to do your research most likely there. Uh, appliances or don't take on clients that you're not capable of doing or want to do the research for uh, if, you don't, if you're not gonna do that. So uh, appliances, carpets, furniture, etc., used in a residential rental real estate activity. So notice when we talk about these types of classes of property, remember that from our standpoint as a taxpayer, our general concept is we want to depreciate sooner rather than later. So if they would have allowed me to expense it all up front, I would have done that, just called it equipment expense. If they're gonna force me to put it on the books as an asset, the taxpayer is going to say, okay, well, I want to use this, this the 179 deduction or the special to take it all up front anyways, if they let me. But if they don't let me do that, then what am I going to do? I'm going to say, I want the shortest lifespan of the property possible because I want to take the cost of the depreciation over three years rather than have it lag out until five years. So now that becomes important for the classifications and the tax code is going to try to be very stringent so that we have to use the classifications that they want. This becomes quite important when you talk about real estate because you can imagine things on a building like a giant office building and being able to parse them out and say, is this something that qualifies as 
part of the building, which has a very long depreciable life, which we don't want to be depreciating over, or can I take some of those parts out, appliances, carpets, furniture, and say that I'm going to, I'm going to depreciate these over five years instead of like 30 years, right? That would be, that would be beneficial. That's kind of a specialty uh, type of area. Some firms, that's basically what they do. <laughs> they, they break out all the categorizations of like buildings, for example. So cer certain uh, ge geothermal, solar and wind energy property and many machinery equipment other than grain, bin, cotton, uh, ginning, uh, assets, uh, fence or other land improvements used in farming, business and placed in service after 2017 in tax years ending after 2017. The original use of the property must be uh, begin with you after 2017. All right, seven year property. So now we're up to seven years. So office furniture and fixtures such as desks, files and safes. So obviously quite common for small businesses. I uh, used agricultural machinery and equipment placed in service after 2017, grain bins, cotton gins, assets, or fences used in a farming business, but no other land improvements. We've got the railroad track. We've got any property that does not have a class life and has not been designated by law as being in any other class. So this is like the bucket, the bin, obviously, uh, the tax code trying to be as restrictive as possible to classify exactly where they want to put things so you don't have the leeway to just try to depreciate it all up front but they're never going to be able to classify everything so this is kind of like the bucket that they're going to dump stuff into if <laughs> you can't find any other place to put it certain uh, motorsports entertainment complex property uh, defined later any natural gas gathering line placed in service after April 11, 2005. See natural gas gathering line and electric transmission property later. So then we have the 10 year property. What falls into that category? Vessels, barges, tugs, and similar water transportation equipment. So 10 year property, possibly less common for most like small businesses. So like I say, a lot of small businesses, a lot of their properties probably going to be within the three, the five, and the seven year property. And then you've got certain types of businesses that are gonna have like the 10 year property, as you can see, vessels, barges, tugs, any single purpose, uh, agricultural or heterocultural structure, uh, any tree or vine bearing fruits or nuts. So qualified small electric uh, meter and qualified smart electric grid system defined later placed in service on or after October 3rd, 2008. Then we have 15 year property. Certain improvements made directly to land or added to it, such as shrubbery, fences, roads, sidewalks, and bridges. So we talked a, a bit about the shrubbery becomes kind of an issue because there's questions in terms of is it part of the building if it's close to the structure because it would have been taken out if you remove it from the structure and so on and then how are we going to depreciate that type of property any retail motor fuels outlaw outlet defined later such as a convenience store any municipal wastewater treatment plant uh, in initial clearing and grading land improvements for gas utility property electric trans uh, transmission property that is section 1245 property used in the transmission at 69 or more kilovolts of electricity placed in service after april 11th you can see 2005 very specific there any natural gas distribution line placed in service after april 11th 2005 any telephone distribution plant and comparable equipment used for two-way exchange of voice and data communication and qualified improvement property defined later 20-year property what falls into that bucket farming buildings other than single purpose agricultural and hetero agricultural structures municipal sewers not classified as 25 year property and initial clearing and grading land improvements for electric utility transmission and distribution plants somewhat specific here clearly possibly not the thing that most small businesses will be putting their stuff into 25 year property what falls into that bucket this class is water utility property, which is either of the following. 
once again, highly specialized here. So property that is an integrated part of the gathering, treatment, or commercial distribution of water and that without regard to this provision would be 20-year property. Municipal sewers other than property placed in service under a binding contract in effect at all times since June 9, 1996. So residential rental property. So now we're on to the rental property situation, which again, is kind of more common than some of these utility plants for, for most people you would think. So this is any building or structure such as a rental home, including a mobile home, if 80% or more of its gross rental income for the tax year is from dwelling units. A dwelling unit in a house or apartment used to provide living accommodations in a building or structure. So notice they changed kind of the names here. Remember that the, the general idea is we're giving the classifications of property. Most of the classifications also kind of give you the years that you're the, the life of the property we're going to use for depreciation methods kind of in the name, but we'll also have the lives per category. And then of course, residential rental property, we'll talk about uh, the life of it uh, shortly, but they're naming it not by the number of years, but by saying it's residential uh, rental property in this case. Okay. So uh, it does not include a unit in a hotel, motel, or other establishment where more than half the units are used on a transient basis. So now we have this kind of question as to what is residential property. And when you're talking about a hotel situation, a lot of the, inf it's, it's short-term residence. So you're kind of providing more of a service in that area is I think the rationale or justification for the difference in treatment whereas residential rental property like a, a home or dwelling then that someone lives in for more of an extended period of time they're just using the property in that case and and you're not providing the goods and services and we saw before when we saw the differences between something that might be reported on a schedule c versus something that might be reported on a schedule e you would think the residential rental property if you just have a, a place a residential property a house that you don't live in but you rent it then you're just making money on the rent of the property. You're not doing services. Whereas if you have a hotel, then it's usually not the case that you just have people dwelling there and you're just making money on the property. You have to actively sign people in and out of the hotel all the time to run the property. And you're gonna have to give services such as cleaning the rooms and all that kind of stuff generally. So if you occupy if you occupy any part of the building or structure for the personal use its gross rental income includes the fair rental value of the part uh, you occupy so we might dive into rental property more later but we also have this issue with regards to the amount of the property that could be personal versus rental and that could take a couple different forms for example if you have two pieces of property you might live in one property and you have the second property uh, that you rent but you might use the other property as a vacation home or something like that or you have a situation where you live in a home and you rent part of the home a, a piece of your own home that you occupy and if, and obviously those two things kind of complicate our calculations as well and that second one also complicates things because the question would be well is the property you're renting more like a hotel then or is it more like a rental property? Should it be reported on the Schedule C or Schedule E? Is it subject to self-employment tax or not? Okay, non-residential real property. So this is Section 1250 property, such as an office building, store, or warehouse that is either residential rental property, uh, uh, that is neither residential rental property nor property with a class life uh, of less than 27.5 years. So usually you're talking non-residential property. You're talking not family homes or something like that or dwelling units. You're often thinking like office buildings and, uh, and business units, for example. So qualified rent to own property. Qualified rent to own property is property held by a rent to own dealer for purposes of being subject to a rent to own contract. It is tangible personal property generally used in the home for personal use. So it includes computers and peripheral equipment, televisions, 
video cassettes, recorders, stereos, comcorders, appliances, furniture, washing machines, and dryers, refrigerators, and other similar consumer durable property. Consumer durable property does not include real property, aircraft, boats, motor vehicles, or trailers. So if some of the property you rent to others under a rent to own agreement, uh, is of a type that may be used by the renters for either personal or business purposes, you can still treat this property as qualified property as long as it does not represent a significant portion of your leasing property. However, if this dual use property does represent a significant portion of your leasing property, you must prove that this property is qualified rent to own property. So rent to own dealer, you are a rent to own dealer if you meet uh, all the following requirements. You regularly enter into rent to own contracts defined below in the ordinary course of your business for the use of consumer property. So clearly this, this is gonna be something that's specific towards a per certain type of industry, which, why I'm, which, which is why I'm going through it fairly quickly because it's not as general a concept that's going to be applying to, to many different types of small businesses. And we might talk about rental property more specifically in a future presentation. So a, a, a substantial portion of these contracts end with the customer uh, returning the property before making all the payments required to transfer ownership. So the property is tangible personal property of a type generally used within the home for personal use, rent to own contract. This is any lease for the use of consumer property between a rent to own dealer and a customer who is an individual which meets all of the following requirements. Uh, is titled rent to own agreement, a lease agreement with ownership option or other similar language, provides a beginning date and a maximum period of time not to exceed 156 weeks or 36 months from the beginning date for which the contract can be in effect, including renewals or options to extend. Provides for regular, periodic, weekly, or monthly payments that can be either a uh, level of decreasing, can, that can be either level or decreasing. So if the payments are decreasing, no payment can be less than 40% of the largest payment. Okay, it provides the total payments that generally exceeds the normal retail price of the property plus interest, provides for total payments that do not exceed $10,000 for each item of property, provides that the customer has no legal obligation to make all payments outlined in the contract and that at the end of weekly or monthly payment period, the customer can either continue to use the property by making the next payment or return the property in good working order with no further obligations and no entitlement to a return of any prior payments. Provides that the legal title to the property remains with the rent to own dealer until the customer makes either all the required payments or the early purchase payments required under the contract to acquire legal title. Provides that the customer has no right to sell, sublease, mortgage, pawn, pledge, or otherwise dispose of the property until all the contract payments have been made. So motorsports uh, entertainment complex. So once again, somewhat of a specific category here. So this is a racing track facility permanently situated on land that hosts one or more racing events for automobiles, trucks, or motorcycles during the 36 month period after the first day of the month in which the facility is placed in service. The events must be open to the public for the, for the price of admission. Then we have qualified smart electric grid system. So again, somewhat specialized, possibly not the thing you're going to likely see all the time on a small Schedule C uh, or generally any you know Schedule C sole proprietor type of business. But here's another qualification or another type of uh, the asset here. So qualified smart electric grid system. So a qualified smart electric grid system means any smart grid property used as a part of a system for electric distribution grid communications monitoring and management placed in service after October 3rd, 2008 by a taxpayer who is a supplier or electric gener uh, uh, energy or a provider of electrical energy services. Smart grid property includes electronics and related equipment that is capable of sensing, collecting, and monitoring data, 
uh, of or from all portions at a utility's electric distribution grid. I'm not going to go into this one in too much more detail because that's pretty specific. Retail motor fuel outlet. So real property is a retail motor fuels outlet if it is uh, used as a substantial extent in the retail marketing of petroleum or petroleum products. So again, somewhat of a very specific type of industry, not one you're often going to see all the time on a sole proprietorship. Qualified improvement property. Generally, this is any improvement to an interior part of a building that is non-residential real property, and the improvement is Section 1250 property, is made by you, and is placed in service by you after 2017 and after the date the building was first placed in service by any person. So I'm going to jump forward on this one as well. Qualified smart electric meter. So a qualified smart electric meter is any time-based meter and related communication equipment which is placed in service by a supplier of an electric energy or a provider of electric energy services and which is capable of being used by you as part of a system that meets all of the following requirements. Again, somewhat of a specialty area, so I won't dive into the details on that one. Natural gas gathering line and electric transmission property. So any natural gas gathering line placed in service after uh, April 11, 2005 is treated as seven year property. Once again, somewhat specific, so I won't go into a lot more details on that one as well.